Hey guys, welcome to this week's Money and Investing Show. This week we are looking at our immediate reaction post the Labour Party win in Australia's federal election. The good, the bad, the ugly, where the juxtaposition sit, politics versus policies, plus much, much more. There are some big risks out there. We'll acknowledge and discuss what they are so that we can help you best prepare your portfolio to profit from what's ahead. Hey guys, welcome to this week's Money and Investing Show with me, your host, Andrew Baxter, and as always, my offsider and co-host, Mitchell Laurentiel. Thank you for having me on the show, Mr. Baxter. Now, I know you look pretty relaxed in that warm, nice sweater, but I'm going to get you rolled up today because we're going to talk <laughs> politics. Uh, we've just seen Albanese and Labor take out the election. Is that really the case? I guess we'll explore that further. But ultimately, we're going to talk about how they won the election and then some of the issues they may be facing down the track. Big topic, isn't it? Love the teal coloured shirt. I hope that doesn't represent where the cross went over the weekend. Oh, so, uh, um, yeah, it's an interesting one. And, and, and I think this uh, this election, firstly, I'm, I'm, I'm still scratching my head how you can receive 32.5% of the vote yet have a majority uh, government. Uh, well, can you break that down, how that actually worked, just for any maybe young listeners, for I guess example. it's on second party preference. So, you know, we've got a peculiar uh, version of democracy in this country. How about starting this off on a, a controversial basis? And, and that is that it's not just your primary vote, but your secondary that then counts towards the overall outcome. And, and you know, given particularly this election cycle where we've seen both of the the, the, the major parties really score fairly low, uh, you know, 30 percent or 32 and a half and about 34 percent of the vote each. And there's a massive groundswell in the middle, the middle ground, the teal voters and some of the independents and, uh, and the Greens and a number of other parties in the middle of, of sort of mopped that up. And, uh, and and maybe it is time for a bit of an overhaul of, of politics in our country. Uh, you know, the two parties that are in power, uh, that, that are the primary parties, you know, when they started off, there was only one gender that could vote. And uh, when they started off, there were only two genders and we're in a bit more of a complicated world than that now. And, uh, and maybe our politics needs to reflect it. But look, parking all that to the side and I, I won't get riled under the collar on it, um, yeah, it was a very, very interesting election campaign and, and, and one that was more full of politics than policies. And now that's all done. And now we're sat there looking at the policies. You wonder, well, what exactly are we looking at? And potentially some big problems or potentially a little bit of backpedaling and loss of face. So, Well, let's talk to that policy versus politics. What do you mean by that exactly? Well, I think, you know, both, both parties and irrespective of your political allegiance, both parties were saying, all sorts of things in the immediate run up to the election with a view to trying to get elected. Um, you know, from the, um, the Morrison camp was the notion of being able to access super. Uh, to buy your home. And, and I actually don't think that using super to buy your home is such a bad idea. I just don't think it was right in the way that that policy was was put forward. Um, could become a very useful tax revenue line uh, f- because at the moment a primary place of residence is tax-free, whereas if you do it in super, at least it's getting taxed at 15%. And so therefore, um, you know, there's some money coming into uh, the federal coffers. So there are some merits to doing that. The, the policy that was put forward was just a desperate attempt to deal with the issue of stronger house prices and a lack of affordability. On the other side of the coin, um, you know, Tom Albanese's uh, policy of uh, or, or suggested suggested policy of the government are going to come to the party and, and help you buy a house by um, co-signing for it to all intents and purposes is sheer lunacy. Um, That's yeah. crazy to my mind. Uh, you know, in terms of why would you want to transfer risk? from the private sector to the public sector by backing uh, somebody's property investment. Sure, that at some point they're going to have to pay pay it back. But what if there's a negative equity situation on the property? How does the government then recover its funds? So it's, it's just sheer yeah, craziness. And, you know, I always look through a rather cynical set of lenses for life when you hear the expression, we're from the government, we're here to help, because usually it has you know, the opposite and inverse uh, effect on people. Whatever they try to do to help tends to do the opposite. Okay, so diving a little deeper, we had a fair few... I'm trying to be balanced here. I know, you're doing a good job so Mm. far. Let's see if we can keep it. It's my job today to keep you on track. Manufacturing and wages, that was one of the big push um, in in Labor's perspective. So can we talk about how they sort of differ and why you can have one but not the other? Yeah, this was the stalwart, the notion of higher wages for Australians, which, let's face it, is a vote winner. Everyone has got a level of self-interest uh, in their mind when they've got the pen or pencil in the, their hand and they're putting their cross in the box. But, you know, at the end of the day, higher wages on the basis of what? And I'm, I'm a huge advocate for free markets. Uh, I've spent my entire professional career in free markets. Uh, yes, I am a capitalist. I'm an entrepreneur. Um, I'm, uh, I'm male, I'm pale, and I drink ale. Well, there you go. You're the most sins. hated person on the planet. And 
markets typically set their own equilibrium uh, of price. And the labor market is a very good example of that. When you have a shortage of supply and strong demand, prices go up. When you have a lack of demand and oversupply, prices go down until they reach that point of equilibrium where supply and demand meet, and that is where the transaction is done. As soon as you get an overlay of interference in that, you end up with a very uncompetitive and ineffective market. I'll give you a very classic example of this in the 1970s, uh, Great Britain, United Kingdom, my, uh, my country of uh, birth and my old home, um, joined the common market, which subsequently has become the European Union. And for farmers in the common market, there was a government subsidy. So they'd say, look, this year we want you to grow these crops and here's what you're going to be paid per ton. So you know in advance what you're going to get paid. So every farmer within the, uh, the, the various countries within the union would grow that crop because they've got a guaranteed price for it. Now, at the end of the year, you get massive oversupply. None of the other crops that were lower priced have been grown that you actually need, and you've got an oversupply of what you don't now need, and, and you've got stockpiles of it for years to come. So there's a classic example of price manipulation when you should leave things to the natural causes of a, a, an orderly and fair market. The labor market is exactly the same, and the notion that and I know in the in the run up to the election, um, you know, Albanese was saying we're going to have you know, wage increases of five point one percent, which he backpedaled on that two days before the election. Thank God. But no one remembers the backpedaling; they just hear the five point one percent jump on it, another way of winning votes. Um, the reality is, if you give everyone a five point one percent pay rise, it doesn't suddenly lift the cost of living pressure on people does not fix the problem at all. In well, fact, it just exacerbates it. Because now you've got an extra 5.1% of wages in an economy chasing after goods and services, which will then push their price higher, keeping them out of reach and adding further fuel to the inflation fire that we don't need. It is simple economics. I'm an economist, so I suppose it's maybe not simple econo- economics. The reality is when you add more money into the equation, you will have more inflation because inflation has come about in a situation we have in Australia right now and globally where there are supply chain issues. Try and buy a new car and there's a 12, 14, 18 month wait list for it. Try and get fuel. Okay, and we'll talk a bit about uh, petrol prices, I'm sure, as we go on through. All of these different things are are, are supply related issues. And so if supply is limited, but there's more money available, you have an auction, you've got more bidders for less resources, price goes up and now everyone's got more inflation and things are still out of their control. But worse still, employers have got to underwrite a pay rise in an environment where maybe their margins are already being squeezed by higher input prices to what they build. Let's say you're a builder and now you've got a 5% jump in wages on top of the rise in material costs that you have. Um, No wonder so many builders are going pop right now because you can't seem to do it. We've got 8 million people that are either small business owners or employed by small business that perhaps are struggling in the current economy where their turnover hasn't even recovered to pre-COVID levels of three years ago, that with an increase in superannuation, which comes into effect in in July, next another half percent on super, it's 10.5% now, um, plus a wage cost when you're relying on not a wage as a business owner, but invoices to be paid, and you've got companies that you've supplied being tardy in that, your cash flow is gone, your margins are getting squeezed, and I suspect you're going to see one of two things, either small businesses fall over if there's a mandated pay rise like that, or you see the number of hours that people are given to work cut back to keep wage levels in terms of what the company has to pay for the job at a consistent level, neither of which are a great outcome. So there's a classic example of that. Now, that's that's if you want higher wages. Now, the other side of the coin is, or, not and, or you can have manufacturing. And the big platform going into the election, we're gonna create manufacturing jobs. We're gonna have manufacturing back in Australia. We're gonna build stuff here again. But the reason we don't do that now is because wages are too high compared to lower wage countries in Asia. And don't get me wrong, people deserve a fair go. If you work hard, you deserve to be paid. No question about that. I've got absolutely no issue. You guys all know that. We like writing big checks for people when they work here because if they work hard, they deserve the remuneration that they get. Nothing to do with that. If you've got a situation such as manufacturing where you're trying to create manufacturing jobs, If you have high wages, you cannot have manufacturing jobs because somebody in China, India, Sri Lanka, Thailand, Vietnam, Korea is going to do the job significantly cheaper. And that's where stuff will end up getting manufactured. You can't have both, yet it was a platform that went in. So which one is it? 
Yeah, I mean, how if you're Albanese in the government right now, you've probably got a few challenges that you're facing, right? Well, the biggest challenge is it's very easy to be in opposition. You can say anything in opposition because there aren't any consequences when you're in office. Um, you know, there's, there's the expectation of delivering on what was promised, and that's a huge shift, particularly when you haven't had a government for 10 years. And again, you know, there's no political allegiance in here. What was, uh, you know, what were the policies of the Liberals going into this election? And it's very, very hard to describe because there weren't really any. Scott from marketing was coming out with a slogan every five minutes, but really there were no concrete directional policies on 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 the big things, infrastructure. Um, you know, we saw through COVID and, and you know, the government's response through COVID was actually pretty solid. Um, you know, JobKeeper did a great job of keeping the Australian economy ticking over. Josh Frydenberg lost his seat in the election, um, but came out with a did a terrific job. Great job as treasurer, and and, um, and you know, had the election been held probably a week after the budget, they would have seen a liberal landslide, I'm sure. Um, but circumstances, yeah, have have subsequently changed, and that's how fast moving yeah you know, this economy is. So yeah, there are some big issues. So yeah, let's look at infrastructure, and in the case of yeah you know, Anthony Albanese, the 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 his former ministerial post was as Minister for Infrastructure under Kevin Rudd and Julia Gillard. And um, and so if we take the route of, okay, well, we're going to increase infrastructure spending, we're going to develop the regional areas to, to, to create jobs out there, all admirable policies, the challenge you have on spending on infrastructure is that at the moment there is a critical shortage of materials for building. That's why prices for construction are through the roof. And now you've got the government maybe going, okay, here's a multi-billion dollar government pot to spend on infrastructure to compete for those same resources that are already sky high price wise. What that does is put further pressure on the building industry. You're also gonna see further wage pressure as construction companies versus government projects compete for a limited pool of, uh, of workforce, which then gives you even more inflation, which is the very thing that you're trying to calm down and make sure that people have got a quality of life where they can afford their groceries and to fill their car up. So, you know, if you get on the infrastructure spend path, that's just going to be like pouring, you know, 98 octane fuel onto an already raging fire as far as inflation is concerned, it makes it very challenging. Ooh, I have to take a deep breath after that. That was a lot of dots to connect. Oh, Amy. The, and, and, and look, they're, 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 they're all they're all in there. Um, yeah, and, and, and there there are, there are plenty more afoot, and it becomes this very complex uh, web of how all of these things connect when you actually lay them out as okay. Here's our policy: we want to increase wages. Nothing wrong with that, provided there's more return being created for the economy from those higher wages when it's just a unilateral pay rise to try and enable higher affordability levels for property or a better quality of life, it will have the opposite effect because you know, if you said to someone, right, we're gonna give you a hundred grand grant as a first home buyer to buy a house, you haven't made property a hundred grand more affordable because anyone selling a property is now gonna add a further hundred grand to the price because there's that three hundred thousand dollars floating around there very, very dangerous uh, scenario uh, to have to try and play. Um, you know, and, and they're just some of the challenges facing the government as they come in. Um, you know, and as I say, there are, there are plenty more besides. We might see a further push up in, for example, um, you know, the superannuation, uh, which you know, has been held back uh, till July, 10.5%. Ultimately, it's going to go to 12 and probably will under labor, which is a further pressure on employers uh, when it comes to remuneration, which is at odds with paying people more because that's 12% of their salary. You pay them another 5%. 5% pay rise, plus 12% super on top of that. That's a lot. And that's that's for a lot of businesses, their their profit margin out of the window. And look, this isn't about this isn't a story about capitalism and oh, it's just gonna make it hard for people to make a profit. Small business is the lifeblood of our country. And as I say, there are 8 million people either employed or have a small business, under 50 people that are out there uh, in the economy grinding things out. And it's very, very tough. And there is no cohesive government policy to help those. There's just the spectre of higher wage costs if you can get staff in that environment. And, and that's a really, really difficult space uh, to, to, to be looking at. And look, you can pick apart various other things that happen um, during the, the, the hustings and the debate ahead of the election. That's all in the rearview mirror now. We have a Labour government. 
What's going to be quite tricky, I think, for the Labour government is that they don't have the Senate, uh, so it's going to be quite hard for legislation to get through. It gives the Greens a very, very strong position in terms of making sure that happens. And you know, last time we had a Labour slash Green Party, um, you know, if, if we've got anyone that's a farmer listening to this, you know, that needs no introduction with things like the live export ban and the disaster that brought on our agricultural industry. Um, at the same time, I think, you know, having... Uh, uh, that lack of uh, ability to get legislation through in the Senate is going to mean that the Labour government are going to have to tread very lightly, at least for the first year of their tenure, uh, to not change things too much. There's a very, very fine balance at the moment, and we've got huge macro issues globally. You know, we've got China that's closed effectively. We've got a war in the Ukraine. Uh, we're still recovering from COVID in terms of supply chains and, and everything else that goes alongside that. It's not um, a landscape where you're going to see huge, broad, massive policy pillars. And that probably will suit Labour quite well going into this because, you know, just keeping things with the status quo is roughly where it's at with a slight touch on the dial here or there is likely to be the best way to manage this economy as it stands right now. A big infrastructure spend or you know, re-building re, uh, manufacturing, uh, as I say, I'll be amazed as an economist, I'll eat my hat, I'll do it live on this show. I'd love to if see If we that. have higher wages and a booming manufacturing industry in this country, a hat of any description, a Kevlar helmet even, because it won't happen. That's a pretty big bet to take, right? All right. The humiliation in front of our hundred thousand plus subscribers of having to eat, uh, having to eat a hat here, but you know, so I think those policies, given conditions, will probably just ease into the background and drift away, um, and uh, and we'll just see things largely unchanged. I suspect over the next twelve months. You know, again, typically under a Labour government, you expect to see a larger, more bloated public um, uh, public service, uh, which is another burden on the taxpayer. Maybe that's not something we're going to see this time. I think um, one of the uh, one of the First orders of business that came out uh, on Monday was uh, the uh, the dismissal of the highest paid civil servant in Australia, nine hundred sixty thousand uh, dollars, for the person that's inve uh, investigating the parliamentary conduct uh, around the Brittany Higgins uh, sexual assault, uh, who's being retrenched. Not surprised at nine hundred sixty grand a year. It's uh, it's not bad. Yeah, decent wicket. Okay, so AB, that's a lot to take in. Now, for our listeners out there, and their heads probably spinning as mine is a touch as well. Three, three expectations from yourself in the next year that our listeners can take away. Just three. I don't think you're going to see a lot on the Australian political landscape, even though we've just had an election. As I say, I, I think the smart thing to do would just be just to let things settle down and just tinker with the dials and knobs rather than pull any lever in too much of an aggressive manner. That will be really smart politics, but smart politics in one sentence is arguably an even better juxtaposition than we've <laughs> talked about. Um, secondly, you know, the, the, the big issue that will overshadow anything that we're talking about here is the geopolitics of what's going on in the world right now. You know, we've got Russia and the Ukraine at war and the spillover effects of that in terms of energy, uh, in terms of the expansion of NATO, political tensions around the world on the back of that and so on. That's a big thing. China being shut down at the moment too with its zero COVID policy is probably the biggest risk on markets and risk for our economy. Because if China stays in a prolonged slowdown, it's not good for iron or exports or coal, which are our two biggest exports. In turn, that's not good for our budget, which is not good for being able to spend. Um, so, you know, China and, and that situation is is um, is a big risk. Here's, here's a positive. I feel like I've sort of been a bit of a negative Nancy here. And you got the old man on. sweater to back it up. It's okay. <laughs> I don't know if it's all. It's, it's its finest, mate. I'm trying to sort of be suave and sophisticated as I slide into my midlife crisis. <laughs> um, the, um, the, the the reality of having China shut down is a double-edged sword. Yes, it's not good from iron ore and coal consumption. But here's an interesting one that a lot of people wouldn't have thought about. With China being a lockdown, there's about one, one and a half million dollar, uh, barrels of oil per day not being consumed. And that's gone a long way, I think, to softening oil prices and the pain that we've got at the Bowser. When China starts to open up again, expect to see this, we'll look out for it now, um, a fairly decent hike in energy costs once again, particularly as you know we're not sourcing our energy from Russia anymore. Um, and, and, and so watch out for that as China starts to open up that inflationary cycle on the back of, um, on the back of oil prices moving it with that extra demand is there. And again, that highlights the point I made, supply and demand when they're in equilibrium um, are very, very important. 
And when that equilibrium is disturbed by either a change in supply or in the case of China reopening up a big shift in demand, prices move radically. And if we see that in our labour market in Australia, I think that's going to be the single biggest risk on our domestic economy, parking all of the uh, various uh, issues around the world to the side domestically. Biggest single risk is an interference in our labour market and particularly pay rates. And I'm not for paying people low levels. I want to pay people as much as I humanly can. You know that from being here. You know, we want to pay people as much as is humanly possible for the labour and the value add they bring to the business and to the clients. And it still needs to be market forces. There's an equilibrium there. If you interfere with that and say, no, you must pay someone this, whether they deserve it or not, or uh, things in that sort of nature, it disturbs the balance. And, and that's a really dangerous situation. That's my, my pick for the single biggest risk over interference in the labor market and the disruption that that will cause. All right. Well, let's um, fingers crossed that we don't see that AB. In any case, that was an awesome rundown on the election and I guess what we could see moving forward. So thank you very much. My pleasure. Anytime. See you in four years time. Done. <laughs> There you have it, guys. Make sure you give us a review and a rating, and we'll look forward to seeing you next week.